What are some of the top questions you need to know before your first interview as a Scrum Master? Hello, welcome to the Scrum Chat Room. And today we're going to look at 35 questions, which are among the most frequent asked questions whenever you are heading out for an interview as a Scrum Master. And even within the space of Agile, you can still leverage some of these questions. Uh, when we ask every question, we are going to look at it from a three dimension. So this is definitely not just uh, a usual question and answer, but helping you to understand why that question is asked and what are some of the perfect answers you can give in the scenarios. So uh, let's get started before, um, let's get started right away without wasting much time. The first question, which is top on our list today, is going to be, what different KPIs have you used and which one do you think is the most effective in your experience? Now, this question is asked to you as a Scrum Master. When they ask what different KPIs have you used, the first thing you need to understand what KPIs are. KPI simply means key performance indicator. Now, alternatively, this question can also be asked, what are some of the key performance indicators you have used to evaluate your team as a Scrum Master and which one is your favorite? As a Scrum Master, we do understand that they are, you have the burn down chart, you have your velocity chart, you have your spring report, you also have the happiness index, you have the burn down chart as well. Now, when talking about a favorite, it's about how you justify it. I can say that, Oh, the velocity chart is my favorite because it helped me to in a very um in 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 in, in one instant to be able to see what has been the strength of my team in terms of their performance. Are they stable? Are they fluctuating? And it helped me to now follow up with more information. I can say the string report is my favorite because it gives me the details of what stories were completed, what stories were not completed, at what stage were there when the spring kind of close out. I could also say, oh, I love the burn down chart because it gives me more clarity into what is going out in what is happening in the spring day in, day out. And also I can see if something was added, something was removed, and it also helped me to see if the team is uh, pulling work towards the end of the sprint and helped me to generate more questions. I can also say, and this one is my favorite, this the um, team happiness index is my favorite performance indicator. When I talk about the team happiness index, it simply means that is my team happy? If someone were to visit uh, my team having a retrospective, can they see that, oh, wow, I love to be in this kind of team. Is there communication? Is there collaboration? Are people open, right? So that's the team happiness index. How happy are we just to just have that low, uh, lovely chart? And at the end of the day, if a team is happy and collaboration and communication is effective, those are the ingredients of a performing team. Then you effectively get your results you need as a team. All right, question number two. If a new product owner join the team who doesn't understand which, uh, much about Scrum, how would you help him? Now, if they join the team and they don't understand much about Scrum, the first reference for you to give them is the Scrum guide that help them to start understanding what are some of these key ideas. Or you can say that if you have your own protocol that highlight the different rules and regulation of the Scrum uh, product owner and how the product owner relate to other members of the team and all the different uh, functionality within the Scrum team, you can help them understand that. Secondly, you want to walk them through your team working agreement. A team working agreement actually specify what are the norms in which your team operate, what are the different events and what are the time boxes, what are the definition of done and all of that. So you also want to walk them through that as well. And you want to just be there for them, right? Having, having a conversation with them and making them know that, oh, you got their back. So it's very important for you to emphasize on this. Question number three, if the product owner is a bit pushy and asking to deliver a user story in between sprints, 
what would you do? Now, this question is an open-ended question. It doesn't say if the story is important or not. It just says they are pushy and they want you to deliver in between. So what they're looking for is for you to understand that we don't just accept stories like that. We need to evaluate the priority of this story. How, how, how urgent is this story based on what we are delivering, based on the increment or based on the spring goal? How urgent is this story? So we must evaluate the importance of every story, whether it's uh, before the start of the spring, whether it's between the spring before we accept the story. So if we evaluate and we see that, oh, this is an emergency that needs to be taken immediately, what we do is that we evaluate the capacity of the team and who is in the better position to handle that story. Even if that person have full capacity, that person can do a trade off, right? That person can drop one of these stories and pick up this one. Now, sometimes if the story this person was working on was already in progress, dropping it doesn't mean taking it out of the screen we might still leave it in the spring and then pick up the other one and start working on. If the story is still on to do, which means that no one has started working on it, we could do a trade-off. Trade-off means we could pull that out and bring the other one in because it's an equivalent, right? They've not started working on it, which means no effort has been invested in the story. But if effort has already been invested in the story and the story was already in progress, you want to leave it in there so that when you pick up a new story, it shows that uh, you already put in some extra effort on the story that was not yet completed. So very important. Number four, mention some of your retrospective technique as a scrum master. All right, so... Uh, I know you have the Sable technique. I know uh, one of my favorite techniques is also the one word technique. And this is also a technique that has been very helpful. Not just, it's a technique that is helpful for you when you start working with a new team. It's not helping you understand them. For instance, if um, uh, let's say I have 10 people in this uh, meeting, right? And this is my first time. I could say, okay, team, can everyone look at the chat box? Write down one thing you think that can best describe you. Now, one thing is not difficult to do, but if I just ask you to start talking, it's like, oh, where do I start? Let's say, write one thing. Now, people will be will be uh, willing and open to just write one thing. And from the one aspect that they wrote, now you can start facilitation. So most often, I will say, okay, look, uh, can you look at the chat box? Can you write down one thing or one word you can describe the sprint that just ended? It helped me to be able to pick that from and start uh, understanding how to put your head. I can just say, okay, can we use one word to describe one thing you think we can improve? So it's a very um, important technique that helps us to push through our retrospective with ease. Now, I also love the appreciation technique. The appreciation technique, it's more like an open-ended technique that gives every team member the opportunity to say, hey, who are you thankful for this print? And now, if I say, hey, I'm thankful to Mary, she was very helpful when we're working on these stories and all of that, it already started giving me some of the strength of the team, right? So by people being thankful, they're not only appreciating other, but in the course of them just naturally saying that they're opening up gaps or they're giving you some of the strength of the team. So it's very important that you can leverage some of this technique in your retrospective, very important. Now, another technique, you can also use a, a, a icebreaker or connection game to be able to effectively pull out the, your conversation. Number five, difference between lead time and circuit time. Now, lead time and circuit time is very important, most especially if you run a Kanban team. Now, a lead time simply means that the time, the product, get uh, the, the, the story get into the backlog until the time is completed. That's the lead time. The circuit time is the time someone starts working on it until the time is completed. So the circuit time is embedded within the lead time. Let's say I bring in story uh, story Monday into the program backlog and it sit there, but then 
a developer is only ready to start working on that story on a Thursday and finish on a Friday. Now the lead time is going, to, the circuit time is going to be one day. This the day they start working on, which is Thursday and finish on Friday. But the lead time is going to be it was in my backlog on Monday and I finished on Friday. So my lead time is going to be five, uh, five days. Now we understand the difference between lead time and circuit time. Question number five. How much are you aware about the scrum of scrum? Oh, this is question number six. How much are you aware about the scrum of scrum? So most often a lot of people uh, make a mistake between the community of practice and the scrum of scrum. Now the scrum of scrum is an event of scrum master coming together and it's facilitated by the release train engineer. The Scrum of Scrum is a typical event in a safe environment. Now in a Scrum environment, right, we should have agile center of excellence, right? Or community of practice where we don't just have Scrum masters, we also have other people within the community like managers and other leaders. But I've constantly see, uh, seen uh, uh, all of these events which are not in a safe environment with everybody and all the team members, they call them Scrum or Scrum. No, it's not Scrum or Scrum. Scrum or Scrum specifically is an event where all the Scrum masters working within a train come together facilitated by the release train engineer, right? So that is the Scrum of Scrum. And it helps us to come together if we're working on the same product We'll try to look at what is our progress towards our bigger goal. What are some of the impediments we need to address and how can we learn from each other? Question number six, technical depth and how to handle it. Now, technical depth, it's also called quality gap depth. So an alternative word to technical depth is quality gap depth. Why do I say quality gap depth? Let's say that we want to build... Um, a system for accepting payments, right? For accepting payments on the student loan, right? And because we want to start using all of this system on, as fast as possible, we make it in such a way that a uh, student can only pay, uh, make payment using first name, last name, and card number, right? First name, last name, card number, and all of that. And that is, we can start that because that's the most common use. But in reality, not all students have first name, last name, and card number. Some may have middle name. Some may also have business name. And this system was not really built to accommodate all of this differentiation that may happen, right? Now, although we're already using the system, we realize that it has a defect in quality, it has a gap in quality because it cannot serve all our clients, right? Because of that, it needs to be sent back to uh, the development team to incorporate all of this aspect that can enable more quality, more uh, delivery capability, right? Now, it's called technical depth simply because initially all of these ideas or items or components were supposed to be built in, but because of one reason or the other, they were not built in. So that is technical depth. Now, if it everything was built in, and it went into the market and it wasn't working well and it sent back, it's called a defect, right? So that's the difference between defect and technical depth. Question number eight, how would you improve the productivity of your team? Now, the first thing to do in order to enhance the productivity of your team is to increase what? Remember, productivity is linked to performance. And now when you look at some of the ideas or some of the dysfunctionality of the team, one of the first one you realize that is lack of trust, and which is a foundation, right? Now, when you start looking at what can I do to improve trust? Now, think about your first day, right? Your first day, what did you do to get that uh, uh, your fiance or your boyfriend, your girlfriend trust you? You communicate, you start opening, you, 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 you don't pretend to be who you are. Right. If you pretend to be who you are, it means you you don't want something really, you don't want to build on trust. So if you want to build on trust, you communicate like re. So you you in order to improve productivity, you want to help your team to improve 
communication and collaboration. Open communication is very open. Give open opinion. If they can do that, then we can be able to find out what is the gap we are missing or what gap do we need to close in order to get to our achievement. Remember, Scrum is all about relentless improvement. It's not about you do this and boom, there's a change. No. So if I can effectively get my team to collaborate, to learn from each other, then I'm sure that no matter the challenge they have, collaboration and communication will be able to address that. All right. If I want to look at this question from the technical angle, what I can also say is that if I look into specifically on the way my stories are being sized, now we're talking about flow. What does flow mean? Flow simply means that your team are, is able to complete the story within the sprint. And if they don't complete it, we can easily identify why they did not complete the stories. What happened is because we try to break down our stories into smaller batches. Let's say that if the maximum story size we have is a three, and three means relatively about three working days, we can easily identify why were we not able to complete this story? But if all my story points are from five story points, eight story points, sometimes it's even difficult to track, right? Because there are several components to build and to test within that story. But when we break down stories into one story point, two story point, maximum three story point, we can easily enhance flow. We can easily have uh, both QA and test staff collaborate within the spring, get story completed and tested within that same spring. But if the story sizes are big and it's an eight story point and the developer is finished their own work, maybe last by one day, there's no way that the tester will be able to complete on the last day. So we have keep on having pi over pi over productivity low down. So if you kind of drop down batch sizes of our stories, it increases flow, it can also enhance productivity. Right. Now, another point that can enhance productivity is having what we call a, a team working agreement. Team working agreement have to hold everyone accountable. It's a standard by which the team should operate, a standard by which we should keep on quality. If we have this standard and we constantly remind ourselves during retrospective on how to maintain this standard, we are definitely going to improve flow. All right. So question number nine, what uh what you cover in a back what do you cover in a backlog? Okay, what you cover in the product backlog other than stories and box. So apart from apart from stories and box, what else can you find in your product backlog? Very important question. You can also find non-functional non, uh, requirements. Non-functional requirements are improvement items. For instance, if we get on the retrospective or realize that uh, there is collaborate, the less collaboration between the back end and the front end developer, and that is an action item, that's a non-functional requirement. We write that down and we add it into a backlog because we want to plan it into our screen and see that this is effectively implemented. So you can also have non-functional uh, non-functional, uh, uh, you can also have uh, non-functional requirements added into your backlog, right? So you can also have documents and attachment on under each of the stories and box that support uh, what needs to be done. Okay. And number 10, prioritization technique. What are some of the prioritization technique? One, we have stack ranking. What stack ranking stories are prioritized based on their priorities from one to five. And then we can now pick them based on how they are prioritized. We have the Moscow technique, which talk about uh, must have, should have, could have, and won't have, where the must have is what must really be there. We want to look at what must we put in this print and all of that. We want to ensure that all of this is happening within the spring. Also, our prioritization technique, uh, we also want to talk about the West Jet, waitest, shortest job press. It's a very important technique that is used at the level of the program to break down stories into backlog. And as a Scrum Master, you need to learn about the waitest, shortest job press. The waitest, shortest job press talk about 
uh, the cost of delay over the size of the story, which means that the story that is costing us more money, if it keeps staying there, we should be able to complete that story first. All right, so uh, we in the top. We already answered the top ten questions. Uh, we still have about twenty five to go. All right, couple of stuff. If you want to be part of our community, where we able to get not just answer this but demonstrate this practically, you can always reach out to us. Check the description box. There's a whole lot of contact details. Our website and numbers. Reach out to us. I'm willing to take my Scrum journey serious and more practical. We'll be able to help you. And our next Scrum, Scrum Master, say Scrum Master certification training is coming up on the 28th of November. If you miss that one, almost every other two weeks, we always have a training coming up. Always reach out to us and you get one of the best training. All right, let's get to Question number 11, how would you convey bad news to the client? Very important. This is a leadership question. How will you convey bad news to the client? Now, bad news is certainly what every client doesn't want to hear, right? But how do you convey that? We still need to convey that. The first thing is that if we have, let's say, one of them might be, we're supposed to deliver an increment by uh, tomorrow, but then for some reason, we are not able to deliver the increment by tomorrow. So in that case, what you want to do, first of all, is to give the a client um, the value and added value of what you've been doing. So let's say we're supposed to deliver this increment. I can just, cannot just call the client and say, okay, Mr. Client, uh, we cannot deliver this into X, Y, Z. So what I I'll call the client, I will say, okay, look, Mr. James, uh, we're working on this stuff. We have this completed, this completed, this completed. I'm giving them what has been done yet. But because um, we still need to add more quality into this and we have a gap in terms of one of our developers uh, was urgently called out, it kind of might be unfortunate that we might not meet this within this period. And I wanted to know your opinion on what you think about not delivering this. And it's more like a negotiation opening up to them and say, look, this is our situation. And then inform them what are some of the options. Don't just tell them that. What are some of the options? Now, what we could do is that um, we could try as much as possible to deliver this in two, three weeks, right? Or we could as well add more costs a year so that we get in an extra person but if we implement this option, this might be a bit expensive for us. So you don't just break out bad news like that. You give them some good news, possible option, possible solution on how we can resolve it. Question number, uh, what number is it? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll lose count of the number. I'm, I'm just going to assume that this is number 13. Uh, is it number 12 or number 13? Let me see. I have a whole list of questions here. Okay, this is question number 12. Conflict management. How will you manage conflict as a Scrum Master? All right, the generic technique of managing conflict first is to build trust. Just imagine you met two people on the road fighting. You never met them. Can you go and start trying to help them resolve this conflict? No. What are you going to do? If you're in the US, you call the cop. That's the way you resolve the conflict, right? But if you met two people within your household fighting, what are you going to do? You try to understand what the problem is and try to look at how you can help them come into an amicable agreement without taking sides. So the same thing in a team, what helps you to solve conflict is the fact that you have built trust because you have built trust because of you, people can relate more to you, which means that if you have not had a good relationship with me, you can come and want to resolve conflict when I have conflict because I don't respect you. So your ability to resolve any conflict is based on the respect you command. And that respect you command is just being there. You don't have to do anything. It's just about being there. People who you respect a lot, I, I don't think they did anything extra. It's just about them being there. Hey, how are you? How are you today? And because they care about you. So when you care about your team and you know exactly what you're going on, you're constantly checking after them, it's easy for you to effectively resolve conflict. 
Question number 13, what are the major difference you see between waterfall and agile? Now, the major difference between waterfall and agile is incremental delivery. With agile, every two weeks we're delivering an increment, but with waterfall, we want to build all the product until we have the final product before we can deliver. So that's the major difference between Agile and Waterfall. And also when we talk about Agile, it focuses more on product delivery, where we start talking about product, we start talking about futures, we start talking about stories. But if we talk about Waterfall, we talk about objective, we talk about the cost, and we talk about the activities and the time, right? But uh, Agile kind of shift away from cause and activities and move into futures and stories and more focus on the business value. Question number 14, what challenge you face to convince a team to go agile? What challenge have you faced to convince a team to go agile? Now, the first challenge is always the trust challenge, getting them to trust you. The reason someone would not easily accept something from you is because they don't trust you. They have never seen you. You cannot just meet someone out and say, oh, will you marry me? Say, oh yeah, I'm gonna marry you. It doesn't happen anywhere, right? Why? Because they need to build that trust. So many people get into a team and they're trying to convince the team, oh, Ajay is good, Ajay is good, Ajay is good. And they say, oh, no, you don't come in here and tell us what is good and what is not good, right? So the first thing you do is that you build that rapport. You try to understand them, meet them where they are, right? So when you end that trust, trust me, they're going to listen to you. So the challenge is always the trust issue. Right, the challenge is also the trust issue. Now, the challenge is also another challenge is the change issue. As human, we don't like change. So when we look at agile as changing from one aspect to another, it becomes a big challenge. And the way to resolve that is to ensure your client that we're not changing. We're just looking at better ways to deliver business, right? We kind of just trying to improve on our processes. So in that way, you can easily go through. Question number 15. When we do the capacity planning, how much capacity will you consider to refactor or fix important box and explore new technology? Now, by default, we should allocate 20 to 30% capacity for box and defaults and refactor. But it also depends on the project you're working on. If the demand on default and uh, default and uh, uh, box are extremely very high. We can allocate as much time as needed based on the context of the problem, of the project, of the product. Now, our goal in the agile environment and the reason we deliver incrementally is because we want to learn as fast as possible. We want to be able to readapt as fast as possible. So because of that, we are constantly open to how we can learn from the feedback we are getting and had to come and to accommodate that. But the default is for you to accept 20 or to maximum 30%. Question number 16, how could you determine the success of an agile team? Now, simple, if we're able to deliver increment regularly to our clients and they are happy, we're successful, as simple as that. You don't wanna go complicating yourself or no. If we can deliver our increment and the client say, oh, well, I'm good, it means we're doing the right thing. We can deliver as planned, right? If we cannot deliver as planned, it means we're falling back. It means we're not collaborating. If we can deliver as planned, our clients are satisfactory, we are good. Question number 17, what is day zero in bend down of the chart? Now, day zero simply means that the day you launch the spring, right? Day zero is the day you launch the sprint on your bend down chart. So it doesn't show any movement. That's the day you started the sprint. So, and question number 18, what does the number on the top represent on day zero of the bend down chart? Now, on the bend down chart, the number at the top is going to tell you the amount of story, the number of story point you committed to. Now, when you start bending down, this, the, the, the number of story points are going down, right? So it represents uh, the number of story points for that spring that you committed to. Okay. Question number, last one, or question number 19. I want to understand how, how do you calculate the velocity and when do you think it is 
in your experience, you get an accurate estimate of velocity of what your team can deliver and what is your velocity exactly dependent on. Actually, I would say velocity should typically be calculated within 90 days, which means you have completed about six sprints. Now it gives you an average amount of work your team can learn from. 90 days is already good time enough to learn from your team to uh, start implementing some of the changes and get them into a state where they become stable. Now, uh, when you calculate that average of 90 days, velocity simply means the amount of, of work your team is able to complete within the sprint. And your velocity is dependent on your capacity. Capacity means how many people, based on their time and effort, they're willing to commit into your team. Question number 20, how do you, you differentiate between product backlog refinement and product uh, backlog grooming? The, the same thing, the same, the same thing. Product backlog refinement are both same meetings. It just depends how you define, you decide to call it. Refinement, grooming, the same thing. All you do within the meeting is to look at how to accept story. You No, not accept story. Look at how you can prioritize your story. Look at how you can assign them to uh, uh, not, re, not really assign them. You make sure you prioritize the story. You make sure uh, they are pointed. You make sure they are ready to move into the spring backlog. And if they are ready at that point for at least the spring that you are uh, grooming for, if you can go ahead and even allocate uh, uh, um, your capacity and who is going to do what, that's also going to be very important. Okay, question number 21. Now, question number 20. Okay, before we've gone to any question, 15 more to go. I'm going to see if I can complete all of, 15, all of the questions. Now, um, just to remind you, our safe certification is happening on the 28th of November and it happens every other two weeks. Uh, you can have all the information on the description if you want coaching, right? If, you, if you've been able to understand how we're explaining this question, it means if you come to the practical part, this is a theoretical part, I always tell everybody, uh, what you get online is a theory. Now, if you really want the practice, know how to, not just to understand what spring zero is and to be able to practically see that by doing that, then that is where you, what you need to do. That's what we talk about, our community of practice, community of practice. We don't just go sit there, do question and answer, right? I don't do the same thing I do with you online. We kind of dirty our hands on the board and get you a seasoned scrum master before you ever get on your first job. Make sure you reach to us as well. If you're already a Scrum Master and looking for a community where you can learn and grow to become an Agile coach, you can have an opportunity to start coaching others. That is also what we do in our community. So let's go to question number 21. Can you walk me through deployment processes? Okay. So deployment processes, the code get developed in the developed part environment. And after that, we go into quality assurance environment. So the developer build the code, we move it to the QA environment. Uh, when the QA, when it goes through the QA environment, quality assessment environment, it goes through the user acceptance environment, user acceptance testing environment. And then for approval, the PO and the business uh for approval of PO and the business. And after the PO accept, it goes into production. So um, very simple way, deployment. When we say deploy, it means that we've accepted that this is done. So not accept, yeah, we accepted that this is done. So the developer is building the code. The code go through QA. QA simply means uh, we do all unit testing on this part. Now, user acceptance simply means that with the user, we look focus more on business value of that story, understand exactly what is going on, right? Now, after it goes through the user acceptance criteria or user acceptance testing, what happened is that it's then approved for deployment into production, right? Deployment into production. Now, the production environment is where we host uh, the, the increment. Now, it's from there that we get it to release to the user environment, right? So the uh, production environment, it should be similar to the user environment. 
So even after we deploy to production, we still have to prepare to release it to our end client. Okay, perfect. Number 22, how do you plan your spring, spring planning? Now, the different step in planning spring, number, step number one, you estimate your capacity and your velocity. Step number two, you ensure that everyone is participating and understand the story, what needs to be done, uh, all the acceptance criteria. Step number three, you estimate the story. You make sure that the stories are effectively estimated. And when they're effectively estimated and are located a story point, step number four, you make sure that someone commit to this story. Someone should say, okay, I'm gonna take this story. And then step number five, now we all accept, we, we all agree on our spring goal and then we launch, commit to accept our spring goal, commit to a spring goal and then we launch our spring. And then spring planning is over. All right. Now, question number 23, how do you make sure that the technical debt is addressed? Now, technical debt, as I said, it's a default in quality. A different in quality, which means that it doesn't meet the quality as expected. What you do is that you always need to assign some time. The time, the buffer you have assigned for your team should be used in addressing technical debt. If all the buffer time has been used and this is uh, the technical debt come back as something that's urgent, we need to reprioritize it. Remember, if it come back, it means it's something that we're already using in the, uh, the end client environment. So whatsoever is already uh, we're already using, if we keep on, if we don't prioritize it as critical, the client is losing, is losing money because they are not being able to use that functionality. So if something comes back that is already in the end client environment, it's always a priority because that is what is creating business value. Remember, I said we prioritize work based on business value. We cannot say, oh, because we have planned the spring, we cannot add anything else. No, we focus in the Scrum environment. We don't do what is right. We do what is right for the business. It is right that we plan the spring and then we launch the spring goal, but it is right for the business that we focus on saving the client money. So very, very important. So if technical they come back, if we have buffer time, we use buffer time to work on it. If not, we'll prioritize it and make sure that uh, it is done effectively. All right. All right, let's jump to question 24. And question 24 says that, what kind of report have you generated and what kind of data are you generating? Now, in a Scrum environment, we know that the kind of report we get help us to understand how our team are performing, right? So this is a question on also, how will you measure performance of your team? Now, when we say generated, report in... Uh, whether you're using Scrum or whether you're using Jira, you're using Ravi or Azure DevOps, the report are generated automatically. You don't calculate them manually. What are the reports that are generated? Automatically, the burn down chart is generated. The spring report is generated. The velocity chart is generated. These are reports that are generated. And I use each of these reports to understand how my team is performing and to design a strategy on how to better coach them. Let's say for instance, I look at my spring uh, velocity report, and in the past three spring, my team has constantly been carrying over work, right? They're not finishing what they're committing to. It gives me an indication that there's something wrong, and I can work out with my team during the retrospective to find out how to improve them. If I also look at my bend down chart, and I see that most of the work is being pulled to the end of the spring, I try to find out, are we sizing the story too big, or what's happening that, now we're not able to complete work early in the spring. All of the work is completed during the last day. So with all of this report, I can effectively understand how to coach my team. And question 25 says that, how do you keep your team motivated? Motivation is very important. And it's something that's very hard to do, but also very easy to do. Now, if you want to ask this question, answer this question, the, my first advice is always like, First of all, take this to life. If you want to motivate somebody, 
what are you going to do? People get motivated when they do the things they like, right? What are the things people like? Things that are connected to their value. So when you connect with your team member, don't just understand that, oh, this is a front-end developer, this is the DevOps guy. So understand them as a person, what cultural background are they coming from? Also understand them. What are some of the things they like to do? They like football, the life stuff. So you start discuss having conversation on them based on what really interests them. In that way, they will be moti they will be motivated knowing that they're in, the, in an environment which care about them. It's not just work, work. It's also about like a family. People are motivated to always meet the people that add more value to them. So in that way, you can motivate your team. Now, never talk about incentive, right? You can give your team member um incentive because it's not really recommended uh or, um coaching technique when you give incentive you probably can create a false environment and people just want to work because they want to get those incentives you want to create an environment where people are self-organized self-motivated and that environment is built on trust is built on relationship all right so very important and the next question says that Question 26, what is the difference between the burn down chart and the burn up chart? Now, the burn down chart shows how the story or the product backlog item are being completed. It shows you how many stories are left for us. So if you complete a story, the chart goes down. If you complete another one, it goes down. So it shows you how much is left for us to complete. Why the burn up chart is showing us the how close we are to the goal, right? Now, the burn down chart show how much work is that as you're burning down. The burn up chart focus on how close are we to achieving the spring goal. So one is coming down, the other is going up, okay? Question number 27. When it comes to Jira, can you tell me about any plugin that you currently actively use? All right, you can talk about Confluence. Confluence is a plugin that you can easily use from Jira. You can also talk about Slack. Some company also adding Slack. Some company also link it to link their teams to their 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 uh Jira as well. So, but the most common is going to be uh Confluence for majority of the company. All right, question number twenty eight. Walk me through some of the complications you have faced in your current jobs. I want to be very careful while, while answering this question. I want to first of all do a disclaimer. I would not say that I've gone through complications because as a leader, I try to see any roadblock as a learning uh, opportunity. But then I want to say that oh, joining my current team the first challenge, which wasn't a complication, was to build that rapport. You know, the first instant when people see you, you need to gain their trust. And sometimes it might be complicated getting their trust. But if you just kind of communicate openly, then you can easily buy in the trust, right? Now, a common complication, which to me is also a learning opportunity, is about adapting in a new environment. It doesn't matter if you've used maybe uh, the, the tools that they're using before. It sometimes get a bit complicated getting into a new environment, familiarizing yourself with a new environment. But because I don't see that as complication, I see that as learning opportunity. It always kind of end up good. Now, question number 29 when you are starting a new project and you are not sure if the project is right fit for kanban scrum or safe so many questions is how would you define what framework is best fit for that project okay how would you decide if to go scrum to go kanban or to go safe now this question is simply asking you what is the difference between Kanban, Scrum, or Safe? And how would you decide what fit what? Now, for me, if the project most often doesn't require us to deliver incrementally, but we're so focused on how we want to visualize or want to track how we complete work, then we're going to use a pool-based system, which is Kanban. Kanban focused on visibility, and focus on prioritizing and completing work. 
But if the project focus on we want to be able to deliver incrementally and we're working on future, there's a roadmap that we need to clearly follow. It leaves me with a choice to choose between Scrum or Kanban. Now with, with between Scrum or Safe. Now with the difference between Scrum or Safe, if the project is uh, not really a complex project, and require maybe just about one to three teams or maximum four teams to complete the work. I'm going to choose Scrum because with Scrum, I would not have to do PI planning and complicated planning. We can all work this out at the level of the team. But if the project is a complicated project and require me to take in more than five teams working on the same product, then I'll need to get more bigger layer of alignment and complexity. So I'm going to choose safe. All right, perfect. Question number 30, sometimes senior stakeholders are not interested in bend down chat. What are the other metrics you can share with them to show them the inside of the project? All right, you can, apart from the bend down chat, what you can also share with your uh, uh, stakeholder, you can share uh, the spring report. Now the spring report gives you details of what was completed and what was carried over and also gives you at what level were these tickets before the carryover. You can also showcase their velocity chart to show them what has been going on, how many stories we committed to and how many stories we actually completed, right? Now, uh, what's another metrics? Apart from that metric, okay, we also have the cumulative flow chart that actually gives you an overview of the entire project based on the circuit time and the lead time. So these are the other reports you can share with your stakeholder. Question number 31, do you have an understanding of what an MVP is? MVP simply means minimum viable product. Now, when we talk about a minimum viable product, it's what is the minimum requirement we need to send this product into the market so that it can be tested. So when we have this minimum viable product, then it help us to be able to get into the, uh, to be able to send the product in the market so that we can effectively test it. So MVP, minimum viable product, simply means that uh, what what futures do we need in order to effectively test that this 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 product can work in the market? So most MVP uh uh goes into the market with a lot of compromise in quality just because we want to test and see the behavior. So we don't want to invest a lot of money in there just for the testing phase. All right. So question number thirty two. How do you ensure that the estimate of the user story is done correctly? Number one, uh, you want to be able to understand how we estimate stories. We estimate story firstly by picking out a story that can be completed in less than a day and giving that a number one. Any other story is estimated relative to that. You can also use the unit testing uh, as an as a measure to estimate uh, the effort that is needed for a story. Let's say that if a story that needs um now I I would definitely not go there because it requires me to explain more further. Now estimate rising is just simply means that let's make sure that this story uh can be completed independently. Right, it can be completed independently without relying on something else. And then looking at the relative sizing, we start by looking at, let's first of all pick something that we can complete in less than a day. And we'll put that, gives that a number one. Any other thing is explained in relation to that one. Then on um, question number 33, you have told us on how you would get your team coach to agile methodology once they are on board, once they are on board. Can you please tell me how do you get them on board? All right, how will you onboard a new team? Now, onboarding a new team is first of all taking them through your team working agreement, ensuring that they, they understand the rules and regulation and on, uh, ensuring that you, you can help them understand, you can find out what knowledge gap they need, what else they need to learn and also ensuring that you introduce them to other members of the team. And with the team working agreement, which is 
definitely the ultimate. You can effectively onboard everyone. You can also have a protocol, which is a checklist to check. Have you gone through the working agreement? Have you understand uh, if they've used uh, some of the tools before? Have you walked them through Jira? Have they already met all, all the team members? Uh, do they have their laptops and all of that? That's what you do um, if you're onboarding as a senior scrum master. Question number 34, what are the key metrics to use to evaluate your team progress as a scrum master? Now the key metrics, you have the bend down chart, you have the uh, velocity chart, you have the uh, spring report as well. You can also talk about the happiness index, right? Those are the key metrics you use. Question number 35, what different KPIs have you used and which one do you think are the most effective one in your experience? Now, KPIs also talk about the bend down chart, the bend up chart, the velocity report, and also the velocity report and also uh, which one? The bend down chart, the bend up chart, the spring report, the velocity chart, uh, yeah, those are the key matrices that you can use. You can also use the happiness index, which is more like qualitative assessment. But I won't say all of these need to work together, right? So there's no preferable one. You can just say, okay, uh, maybe the, the velocity chart gives you a snapshot and can help you look back into more details. But in a nutshell, you need to work with all of these uh, matrices together. Wow. So we did crash. 35 questions, which uh, you will likely come across in any Scrum interview. If this was definitely helpful, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. Also make sure you share. If you want more of this first knowledge, do well, check the link below, be part of our Scrum community, and we are going to see you here. Have a happy week. Happy Thanksgiving. I'll see you.